All right, welcome back everybody to another episode of The Debrief. As always, my name's Tyler Norton and I'm joined by my friend John Bergman who covers competitive climbing for Climbing Magazine as well as for uh, a Climbing Business Journal. And of course, he is the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. This time around, we're talking about the 2023 Villars Lead and Speed World Cup, which just wrapped up, like I don't know what, like 24 hours ago or something like that. We're getting it done early because we got we got plans. And so we got a, we got a jet out of town or at least I do. Um, not not going where I originally thought, but whatever. I'm going to a, a climbing mecca, which you'll find out about later, and it will be disappointing. Just like, it'll be a disappointing surprise, just like when Matt promises a surprise co-commentator for later in the stream, and it turns out to be somebody that I probably didn't know the name of beforehand. That'll be, let's hope we don't end up spending this episode roasting co-commentators. That'll be the end of me calling out co-commentators. But anyway, uh, I, w- I will say when he said that, I I rattled through my mind like, oh, who's Susie you know, who, Good? Like, yeah, like, who's was... who's going to be the legend? Cedric Lachat or something like that? No, not at yeah, all. Not so much. No. I was uh, here. I was thinking, who know, like, who knows? He's in Europe, right? He's going to bring in Chris Sharma or, or uh, Arnold. <laughs> who knows who's in Europe right now? <laughs> like, yeah. Right? But yeah. uh, not not so much. But I, you know, since we're talking about it, and I don't want to bring it up for the losers later, I feel like do you do you get the sense that maybe when he says we have a surprise co-commentator for later, maybe it's covering for the fact that they just haven't lined up the the co-commentator for the next gender. They don't know who it's going to be, so Matt has to start the broadcast, and I guess somebody else has to go like find somebody that's like fluent in English. Because I, I imagine they like they show up in the morning, and maybe they've DM'd people, and they find out like you know Alana's not going to be there. Whoever their like favorites, their go tos are, just aren't going to be there, and they're like, well, we gotta you know we gotta recruit from whoever showed up, right? So I'm kind of hoping that's what it is, and not that he thought. The stream was just going to be holding onto the edge of their seat, waiting to find out that is it Liv Egli or whatever. Anyway, she seems like a lovely, like a lovely climber. Um, but anyway, that's it's not not the surprise that I was getting excited for. So yeah, it, yeah. it worked though because you we were intrigued. <laughs> we were we were thinking, that, oh, I, who in the heck is this going to be? Yeah. Bit of a letdown when, when we found out who it actually was. Oh, okay, gotta say, gotta say. Um, yeah, that's that is not our headline. Our headlines are are. Something else completely, John. I'll just have you start it. What was your uh, What was your headline from uh, from this? My headline is that Vilar delivers the perfect final round, and specifically, I'm talking about the women's final oh, round. Okay. I think right. we can talk about the men's final round, which it was good in its own right, and I think there was a lot of interesting storytelling there. But Tyler, let's talk about this women's final. Let's this, do it. This was. This was a banger. Okay, I was jotting down all the different reasons why this round was perfect. And I know that it, it, we say things like greatest and best, and we throw around these these kind of platitudes, and, and, and we get hyperbolic, and we exaggerate. But I really do believe I have a hard time envisioning this route being any better. Uh, let's go through some of the elements here. First of all, the roster itself. It was a really nice mix of experienced competitors, veterans, and youngsters, or maybe lesser experienced competitors. You have, of course, people like Yanya, first and foremost. You had veterans, including Jesse Pills. You had Jain Kim. And then you had youngsters. Cheon So was in there. She's not quite as young as, obviously, she still was. Low, you know, yeah. But yeah, she's still pretty young. You had Mateo, uh, Mateo Pazzi, who I, I don't think is that young, um, age-wise, maybe I, I don't know her her age off the top of my head, but certainly young in terms of final appearances, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so that so the roster itself was phenomenal, and then on top of that, the route which we can get into, it had multiple cruxes, right? It had first of all there was that dino on the green slopers in the, kind of the middle section, and then there was higher up there was that blue scoop that the competitors had to on the head wall they squatted down and they were trying to kind of press up with the right hand and reach up with the left hand and then even at, to get to the top there was a, a little dyno now not many women made it there but nonetheless that was a still a pretty exciting concluding move it, it all led into great separation right look at the scores it was like there was 40 plus there was 40 there was kind of like that mini little bottleneck around that squat on the blue scoop well, let me with- let me can i just interject and let me ask you a question is um what 
I'm going to specify about the root. What, what do you think made the root great? If you, if you think I like, and again, it, it was a great women's final. I'll agree with that. But how good do you think the final route was? And do you think it was great? Like kind of, how do you feel about the climb itself? We've said before how one of the things we want is we want to get the competitors tested pretty low on the route, right? We don't just want it to be gimme, gimme, gimme. And then they get to three fourths of the way up and there's a crux. Like that, the men's route was unfortunately. Like the men's yeah. route, right? This one had some lower difficult sections, evidenced by the fact that Giant Kim fell with a score of 17 plus, she or something like that. She doesn't even get into the 20s. So clearly, the specifically around that green dino, th that was a hard section. Uh, and and above that, then you had the just the difficulty with the the squat move, as I was saying, that's that blue scoop that where Cheon So kind of got stymied there. Brooke Rabatu got stymied there too, kind of time, timed out on it, but mm -hmm. she was taking her time on that as well. And that's another thing that I think made this route great is that you kind of had to motor through it, right? It was it was a hard route, but the clock was ticking, evidenced by Brooke Rabatu. So it just, it had, it had, to answer your question, it had multiple cruxes. It didn't have any gimme moves really once it, once it started. And then to top it off, it had this really innovative sequence up top on the head wall, this 360 move that we hadn't really seen on a lead wall. I know we did see it in Innsbruck on the bouldering wall before in a, in a similar variation of it, but this was pretty unique, pretty new seeing it on a lead wall. Uh, so I, I just thought the route itself was, it was fantastic. Yeah. There's a lot to, there's a, like, there's a lot of different components that you mentioned. And I guess the, 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 uh, uh, the one I want to make sure I don't forget about is that while you're right, I felt like, yeah, there were, there were a couple points where whether or not you call them a crux, like there were points where there was a certain amount of, of, of actual, like, a, um, and the word just eludes me. I don't want to say risk. I don't want to say commitment there, but there were some moves that there was a moment where the, the climbers really had to, to give it their all to get through a particular sequence, which is great. It lets us start separating and, and knocking out some people, which is excellent. And it builds tension for every climber because you, you're like we said, for the men's, you're not just going to watch some cruise 30 moves. And then, you know, it's a salad of people just falling here, there and everywhere. Um, but the, what bothered me, and I think Yanya's statement at the end uh, of her or in her interview was that it was maybe like a little bit too easy where timing out became a bit too much of a factor, in my opinion. And that's the only thing that kind of really soured it for me is, well, you know, a huge component for me is if you get the final climber out and they're the only one to top, that is perfect like that is the dream and it only happens every so often in lead comps but that's like what you're always hunting for it is a little bit you know dulled by the fact that we basically saw a couple other climbers effectively get to the finish if not for timing out um and so when you've got multiple climbers basically getting to the last hold the last move um uh and really just time becoming a factor like Cheyenne could, could have parked on that on that dish for another minute right I think she spent like a minute 10 or something just sitting on one particular hold at the finish it did just kind of like seem like time dulled it and when Yanni came out even though we understood like you know she has to top this thing basically it did feel like it wasn't you know it wasn't just down to difficulty it was just kind of make sure you get it done in the time allotted all fair points fair criticism but let me ask you a simple question when Cheyun was there on that scoop uh, that blue scoop trying 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 were you not were you not entertained right were you not on the edge of your seat just like it like gripped to whether or not she was going to be able to to do that move it was so captivating i and the fact that yanya does say said it was too easy yeah, okay, maybe easy for Yanya, but I, like sure, that kind of yeah. falls flat with the fact that nobody else topped the route, right? It's one thing to say it was too easy when you have like three or four tops, but Yanya was the only one that topped it, so clearly it wasn't too easy. And I know that Brooke and Cheyenne were stalled and kind of yeah. against the clock on that upper scoop, that, that blue scoop, but nobody else really was. All the sure. other women were stymied by other sections lower than that, so... I don't know if it seemed too easy to me. Um, I don't know. 
don't know. Yeah, regardless of the climb itself, the the result that we got out of it and the performances we got to see was excellent. It was it was a lot of fun to see all those climbers feel relevant and seeing so many people get to the top and fight through a bunch of, of different cruxes to to end up there and all of it being a setup to to see Yanya just like cruise it really. Um one one thing that kind of made me laugh was was um the, the question of whether or not Yanya was going to like see the turnaround beta, right? Because this is a story we've seen like the entire season, which is like Manu Hassler's revenge. Flathold puts out that video of them like working that move after it failed in Maringen like last year or the year before or whatever. And of course, Yanya is one of the root setters. They get it in for the, if you haven't seen this video, I, I, I don't know where to link it, but if you go to like the Flathold YouTube channel, it's just a video where a couple root setters, including Manu, uh, try and work. I think it's two different, moves that they've tried to set in the past and they wanted to perfect and they get two athletes it's Yoshiyuki Ogata and Yanya Garnbrett to just like come like workshop these moves with them so this whole season has felt like Manu Hassler's revenge of just this turnaround move is just like in everybody's like vocabulary and of course it shows up on the top of the lead wall this time around and like is Yanya gonna see it I'm like absolutely Yanya is gonna see this but I thought her interview was very telling which was like yeah I saw that sequence and the first thing I was going to do was if I can beat it, like if I can just go, you know, straight, stay face in, I'm going to do that first rather than the turnaround, which makes you realize that in her mind, that move still has a lot of inherent risk and she was going to try and avoid it if she could. But I guess once she got up there, she realized like, yeah, you know what, I can, uh, I can do this. It shouldn't be too bad. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really funny how, uh, how, how man who's got his fingers all over this entire season, bouldering and lead. Wasn't that so fascinating, her interview, where she described it as, I had a plan A and a plan B. Mm -hmm. That was so interesting to, to learn about how her mind processes cruxes on walls, right? She, she explained, she went into this, and you can presume she goes into other cruxes with kind of thinking, okay, I'll do it this way. If I can't do it this way, I'll tr I'll try to do it this other way and so she almost kind of goes into it with two different beta options two different potential methodologies that was great because i don't know if a lot of competitors and some of that probably comes with experience of course but sure. i don't know if a lot of competitors do that where they look at a hard section on a route and they say okay i'm going to try to do this but do they think oh well what if that doesn't work what like what's my next next option if i don't do that i don't know if people have that that sort of long view of the beta on on cruxes. And I think I think for the climbers that and I, I imagine most pro climbers have the skill set, which I feel like I lack, which is being able to look at a route and have an idea of what your body is actually going to look like on the climb and have an idea of like what what the sequence is going to be, what the beta is going to be like. I can do a hand sequence, no problem. But like when my hands are here, where are my feet going to be? I can't visualize that for myself, but I think these pro climbers can. Something Sean McCall always talked about was he feels like he is not only very good at seeing what the possibilities are, but he always felt that what separated him from other climbers was his ability to get to that move where he had created this like tree of possibilities. And he was able to evaluate, in his opinion, faster and then execute faster and with more determination basically than a lot of other climbers he feels like when he gets to a particular crux where suddenly your brain feels like there's options he felt like his intuition was extremely strong and he was able to commit to whatever you know whether it was crazy or whether it was conservative he would just nail it and that was something he used to talk about when he was a little more like towards the top of the field as a reason why he was a kind of an exceptional climber during that period so yeah it is interesting to to hear about and it was kind of also interesting i can't remember exactly how Yanya worded it but she kind of made it sound like it was a little bit like you know well it would be more fun if I turned out to face the crowd right which is such an unusual thing to think about when you're you know you're, you're looking at the finish hold is right above you right and you're like yeah oh, that would just be it might be a little bit more risky but whatever it would be a good show and it would be fun for me so yeah I thought that was kind of charming yeah a wide open opportunity for photographers that were there to or Adidas 510 or whomever you know Yanya's sponsors Red Bull sell posters of Yanya high up on the wall facing the crowd because we're that's such a rare move and it's such a rare instance that the competitor is fully face out like that mm -hmm. and it's certainly just a, an incredibly photogenic moment and uh and that all adds to my headline to go back to the headline that it just was it just was perfect right down from the route setting to the fact that it had that kind of photogenic climax to it it was oh 
It's perfect. perfect. I gotta, I gotta, you're as the resident, like uh, a Korea file, as somebody that's lived in Korea and written about life in Korea, I, I know you're, you gotta be disappointed by the lack of Korean representation on the podium. Like, come on, you gotta, you have to have been a little bit sad, right? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, so this kind of leads into another topic. Let's talk about this. Okay. Uh, l- so I was going to ask you, related to Yanya, what we're talking about, who in your mind at this stage in the 2023 lead season, c- a couple competitions in. Just the lead has, season? Just the lead season. Okay. Who has the best shot at beating Yanya in a lead World Cup? Now, of course, we'll we'll say we don't know. I'm sure rosters will get wonky as the World Cup you know, world championships approach it. So maybe when we won't even say world cup, just if we have an elite level lead climb right now, Yanya is clearly the kind of the person to beat. So who do you see as the, the single competitor with the best shot at, at beating Yanya? Man, that's a great question. Uh, it's hard. And I, like, I feel like the, the best way to analyze something like that would be, would be to say, what would cause Yanya to not win, which in the past, most recently, aside from like mistakes, uh, has has usually been like um, uh, sometimes like the climb being like a bit too easy. And so it comes down to everybody topping and it goes to countbacks kind of thing. But yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I don't know if I would have an easy answer for that. Like, obviously, I think about Cheyenne So, who's done it before. I think about Jesse Pills, who's done it before. Like, I can make the list of the people that have beaten her before, but maybe those were all for like slightly different reasons. And I don't know I'd be able to pick one over the other. Yeah, you could make a case for a bunch of them, and this is kind of, we're kind of leading into my my winner here, and you haven't even given your head. Whatever, yet. let's let's so do that's it. That's okay. Uh, because and and because you were asking about Korea and and the Korean competitors, and the reason I asked you the question is because I think years past I would have said Che Eun So right away, no problem, like absolutely the the person that has the single biggest shot at beating Yanya any given day is Che Eun So. But I am not so sure that's true anymore. I think Brooke Rabatou has kind of maybe pushed into that that spot. Now, granted, I know Brooke didn't didn't get second place here at Villar, but uh, this is who I would choose with for my winner would be Brooke Rabatou because I was looking at her stats on the whole, lead season and Boulder season, and she has, I think she's participated in six World Cups this. 2023 season in total and she's made podium at four of them i think which is incredible enough but then the ones that she didn't make podium in she was like fourth place so it's like almost on podium so i just think brooke rabatou is having the season of her life and i think going back to lead i think she has kind of surpassed chayun so in my mind as the one who seems to be able to give yanya a run for her money or i would I guess give her a run for her money on any given day uh so i don't know you you asked about korea and i kind of dovetailed it into a, a discussion of brook rabatu but it's all good it's all relative <laughs> i see they, you managed to take your two loves is korea and, and of course u.s climbers so you managed to keep it it's all in the wheelhouse yeah i don't i think i think the biggest thing with chayun which is maybe a discussion to have about aimori as well is that chayun of course had that extraordinary season where she did beat yanya in multiple occasions um and kind of similar to the I Mori wins of late last year, you you can say like maybe there were some uh, uh, external factors uh, about Yanya's performance where, you know, in 2019, she had just swept the boulder season. Maybe she wasn't in lead shape. Maybe she was too tired. Maybe it was the pressure of 2019 World Championships. She just wasn't in peak form at the time that Cheyenne just started sweeping the floor. But we're quite a ways removed now from, from 2019, right? We got we're a handful of seasons past that where a pandemic passed. Um, past that entire year and Chayun, while being a, a, a extraordinarily consistent finalist and then a, a regular podium uh, placer, we haven't seen a lot of moments where I was like, oh yeah, her and Yanya are neck and neck. And I make the comparison a lot on the bouldering side where I say like Yanya is kind of a tier of her own and in bouldering, Natalia is kind of the tier below that and then everybody else is underneath her. In lead climbing, if you kind of just average out the last bunch of seasons, Yanya has been absolutely at the top and then it is just kind of everybody for themselves. And you have people that just here and there managed to prick their heads up like Chayun, you know, has her incredible season, but now she's back among the rest of them. I, Mori, haven't had a chance to see a lot of lead coming, climbing from her this year, but, you know, that incredible uh, uh, season ender that we saw last year in um, Coper and Edinburgh, um, 
was, of course, extraordinary. But based on the Boulder results we've seen, are we certain that that's going to uh, happen again? So I still think Yanni is the far and away clear favorite in the in the lead comps. And for the others, I, I just think it's a, it's a little bit muddy. It's hard to pick somebody in particular. Um, the, the one thing I want to say when I set up the Korea thing, I thought we were going to talk about Jane Kim a bit more, but we can save that for no, we can no, save that for later. No, let's talk about it. I think because the, I have a lot to say about Jane Kim. Uh, real fast though, to your to your point yeah. about Cheon, to put a bow on that, I, you know, I wonder if Cheon's results lately, she's kind of a victim of circumstance, specifically a victim of the Olympic combined training. Because if you remember that the when she burst onto the scene in 2019. You know, I'm sure the the Olympics and the combined format might have been like a, a tad kind of on her radar, but she was she was a, a crusher in the lead discipline, right? And then she ended up making the Olympics, and and I would presume she's going. The plan is, or the hope is, that she's going to qualify for the Olympics again. So I think she has probably been focusing more on bouldering and getting better at bouldering, so she can have a that you know a, a more rounded out combined score and it's been working we saw she's had some success on the bouldering circuit but i guess then it's it, it, it's a quest it's a choice right would you rather just be this lead crusher who is capable of beating yanya and we saw that in 2019 but but maybe not you know going to do much in the combined version or would you like to become a combined crusher but as a result of getting better at all the disciplines, you might not be quite the singular standout in lead anymore, right? I, I, yeah, and I'll, I'll like I'll I'll give the I feel like now is the time of year where that would stand out the most, where maybe you would normally have had a lot more time to build up a certain amount of power endurance or endurance training before coming to the lead season, and maybe if you're doing all the boulders, you didn't get a chance to start that early on that, and so maybe at the start of the lead season, you're not quite in that shape. But I mean, this pattern is consistent with last year as well and the year before that. Um, where Cheyenne's only success, well, sorry, I'm being a dick by saying your only success is getting a gold medal, which is obviously like a ridiculous standard. But when you were comparing against Yanya, that's literally the standard we have to compare against. So I was going to say is, is since the 2019 season where Cheyenne had that extraordinary debut run, uh, the only win was, was world championships where, where of course Yanya was not present and, um, so I all, all I think is that I think like her average level, we're starting to see it, which was 2019 was a bit of an upward blip for her, but also probably a bit of a downward blip for Yanya in terms of where their levels were at. And now we're seeing them level out as both being extremely high performing climbers, but Yanya still has that edge, which, you know, we're talking about the greatest of all time. That's not a that's not a slight to come second to maybe the greatest climber that ever uh, the greatest competitive climber that ever lived. So uh, yeah, that's, that's all I kind of wanted to say. My, my real thing about if you don't mind me switching over to Jane Kim real quick, is just like, isn't it a little bit unreasonable for everybody to be like, man, I'd really love it. If Jane Kim managed to like get into finals, like how nice would that be if she get into finals? And then also equally the second she's in finals start being like, man, I really hope she makes the podium. Like, I feel like that it's like pick one. Like, I mean, if, if making finals would be like this extraordinary thing for her like why do we got to up the pressure again once you get to finals like isn't eighth place isn't that by itself just an incredible achievement for somebody that's this late into their career like after you know retiring and coming back like can't we just be like wow in finals at you know 34 35 i can't remember how, how old she is um but i feel like that was enough like i don't i don't feel bad for jane at all for making a world cup finals and coming in in what was it eighth place seventh place i got like that's that's fine with me. She's she's still a, a, a legend, a genuine legend, somebody that the word legend 100 percent fits. And there's only a handful of them. And she's one of them. Yeah, I, I mean, she absolutely is. And we don't need to sit here and, and sing her praises because anybody that watches the show knows about the greatness of Giant Kim. But I it is it, you have you are tempted to we we can't help ourselves, but do what. Every single sports talking head does whenever you have an all time great retire and then return and that it, and, and maybe return and not win. It prompts this question of is this person, quote, tarnishing their legacy is giant hmm. tarnishing her legacy by coming back. And again, this is not you and I making this up. This is this is like sports talk 101 
from when Muhammad Ali comes back to when Michael Jordan comes back and on and on. So it's Jain's turn here. So she left the circuit with pretty much the best possible exit you could imagine, which is <laughs> for real. In, Inzai 2019 World Cup, she gets the gold medal. And now that's not her retirement. She ends up, she tries for the Olympics mm -hmm. and she, I think, does some, some, uh, there were some world championships. There might have been some Asian continentals in there. And, and but stuff that was like, like that. her last World Cup, right? But that was last, the idea. Yeah. Her last World Cup is a gold medal. That is our sports equivalent of a walk off home run to win the World Series, right? And now she's back and she's not winning. She, you know, she, granted, it's only been a couple of competitions, but she's not winning. She's not getting the podium. So the question becomes, would it have been better if just our memory of Jane Kim was left to our memory of her, which is gold medalist ending on top? Uh, what do you think? I, I don't think so. It, at least not for myself. Like, I think the only the only risk you run is 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 people like um what what am I trying to say? Like, the longer you stick around, I feel like people kind of get bored of hearing that you're a legend. And and again, I, I guess what I'm saying is I feel like for people that do like any any little bit of research or anybody that's just watched a couple videos and understands her like extraordinary longevity, her ability to win from such a young age to such an old age, being relevant across what could be considered like two to three generations of competitive league climbing and winning a Boulder World Cup when you would absolutely 100% 100% say that Jane Kim is a lead specialist still winning <laughs> a Bowler World Cup as well you say like no no nothing can take can take that away from you you're one of like the absolute very best that's ever ever competed in the sport and we kind of talk about countries where you know if you just stay like remotely close to your old form she's like a lock for being on the on the korean national team for probably another handful if not like you could say like another decade for for a country that maybe isn't always putting together like a, a huge team of heavy hitters you get one or two per gender kind of thing so yeah jane kim is right up there and still relevant like soul sa is still still like like getting to these events right and you say like well she has she doesn't have anywhere close to the the um uh, uh the trophy cabinet that that jane kim has but she's still out here kicking um so i feel like she could be around for a long time now if she is for around for a long time like you're kind of saying does that tarnish the the legacy i would say no because worst case scenario you show up you don't do well and nobody talks about you but I think the the better, more incredible thing is like there's always that. And this is why I like having them show up is because you're right. There is always the chance that you're going to win and you end up being the oldest World Cup winner in history or you just add another one. And it's just extraordinary, right? Like we talk about the oldest ever climbers and, and some of them. Some of them started not that young, like Robin Urbisfeld is a great example of somebody whose career started in, in her like late 20s. Right. Um, uh, uh, but for the most part, a lot of these climbers that get those like oldest ever World Cup wins, they just had to keep on going right for like a decade and a half, two decades in order to get to that stage. And it's it's it blows your mind when it happens. But you're just like, yeah, the old Salavat Rakhmatov win like at 37, like nobody planned for that, man. That was just like the best day of your life. And you go down in the record books. And I think uh, I think for somebody like Jane Kim, uh, she has that little extra bit of cosmic magic that says, you know, if somebody is going to pop a win at a weird World Cup, why not? Not her after the career she's had why would you ever say that she's not possible of that if the cards just fall in the perfect way so yeah yeah i mean i think anybody would be crazy to be to be dismissing giant kim as a as a threat or whatever you want to call it to win the gold medal I, she's she's absolutely capable of it i she she does i and i wrote about this in my recap her look she's always had that ultra methodical style that that is a joy to watch, but it, it does look like more antiquated than ever. Now it on, made, it made more sense in the eight minute era than it does in the six minute era, for example. Yeah, and, and the eight minute era where you didn't really have like coordination moves that much on lead routes. Right. Certainly not right. to the extent that we do now. So it, it does, she, she does look a little bit like she's from a sort of a bygone era when she's climbing i mean you can look and her her style 
you, you can clearly see it's like from a different era of competitor than everybody else. And that's obviously because she's uh, most of them. She's a decade or more older than everybody else. But uh, but I do wonder, like, hmm, that style, that's going to be really hard for her to win with that style, because the risk is, you know, she the risk is she's going to f- fall or struggle on dynamic coordination moves or she's going to get timed out. That's kind of like the double whammy that Jian Kim is always going to be battling against anytime she's she's in the finals. Another thing that I'll say about this little post-retirement tour that she's on, I'm trying to read into her reasons for coming back, and I feel like she's kind of giving contradictory answers a little hmm. bit. So here's what I mean. She's been asked, why are you coming back? And she says, first and foremost, she wanted to, so her her daughter could see her climbing, Mm -hmm. which is a very wonderful thing to say. Uh, I don't know if I, I mean, her daughter is. (laughs) I'm just waiting for you to drop some conspiracy theory, but like, we've never seen a picture of her daughter. No, no, no. Daughter doesn't exist. No, I was going to say, I think her daughter's like two years old, though. I think her daughter was born in like 20, early 2021. So her daughter's pretty young in terms of being able to like watch and remember her mother climbing but nonetheless that's a I, i'm not here to chip away at that that's a very noble thing to say and it's a, a very inspiring reason to come back but then on the heels of that she also says oh, and i want to go to the olympics <laughs> right and so it the the contradiction comes if you're just here to show your daughter that you're climbing that's great. That's just kind of like a participation thing, right? It doesn't really matter how you do. It, it, it doesn't really, it, it, your your whole goal is not necessarily the placement. It is just to give your daughter that lasting image. Good. If you're climbing for the Olympics as the goal, you're here to win. You want to win because not only to make a shot at the Olympics, but to make a shot at having a shot at the Olympics, right? In terms of seeding for the qualification, Olympic qualification series and stuff like that. If your goal is the Olympics, results matter big mm-hmm. time. And whether or not you get on the podium matters big time. It is not this carefree, like, yeah, I just want to go out there and have fun so my daughter can see me. No, no, no. You have to do well or else you are not going to qualify for the Olympics. So that is the contradiction that I see. And I'm kind of wondering, like, well, which one is it really? Like which one is really not that you can't have two thoughts at the same time, but like which one is really the big motivator? I think I read it more as like I want my daughter to see me try to qualify for the Olympics or maybe get to the Olympics. Like that was kind of more my sense, not so much like, oh, I want to I want my daughter to see me competing. It was more of like I I want to, you know, I don't want to give up the opportunity for my daughter to maybe get a chance to see me compete in Paris or something like that. So I didn't take it so much as contradictory, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think I read it the the same way. I don't know. I think, yeah, between the Asian qualifier where, where anything can happen. And then of course the OQS series, like I feel like she's got a shot. And so why not go for it? Like I, it would probably be the advice that we would give to anybody that's kind of in the same position that she is. And I don't think there's anyone aside from the, you know, Basamawam's the one, obvious exception but the people like sean mccall and and uh well i think sean's the same age as jane kim i think they're both 87 babies or 86 or something like that um but yeah the, what we're saying to Jakob schubert being 33 and and all the 30 year olds that that are still around like we're giving them the same advice it's like go for it like why not like you know even if you're not at the top of the game why wouldn't you try if you're getting that national team spot app this is the time to do it because if it works out the prize is bigger than it's ever been before so like let's get it guys and just in case there's anybody listening that thinks like, oh, these guys are whatever, like these guys are talking bad about Jain or anything. Let me say, there would be no I'm not the one questioning Jane Kim's motives. It's it's this guy here. Well, I'll say this. Let me conclude. Above all, <laughs> would there be a more thrilling story than Jain Kim winning an Olympic gold medal? I mean, good Lord, that would be... So incredible. Can you imagine what those boulders would have to be for her to get a good bouldering rank in 2024? Like how messed up would that be? That would be absolutely nuts, man. It it would be. Yeah, it's it's I mean, it seems like a long shot, but then uh, there's going to be a lot of people that don't have nearly giant Kim's experience going into the uh, Olympic qualification series and stuff. So that's a big X factor. I don't know. There's a lot of. There's a lot of intrigue with Giant Kim in this comeback, and uh, I'm excited she's back on the circuit because I 
she retired. You know, here's another thing that I was thinking about, and I think we've said this before. It's great that Giant Kim is back on the circuit, and she is getting this legend treatment, and she is getting to enjoy this retirement tour, post-retirement thing that she's doing, because she didn't really get this when she left, right? And and I think some of that had to do with she she was on the World Cup circuit and then she tried to go to the Olympics, the 2020 Olympics. She didn't make the team. And I think the fact that Chaeyoung So did make the Olympic team, as, as her Korean teammate, Chaeyoung So did qualify for the Olympics, it was almost just like your attention, instead of being like, sad about giant kim's retirement and 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 sort of turning that chapter for the korean team your attention just got diverted to like oh look at this young korean standout and like that became the story that dominated the the thoughts about the korean team was this phenom chaeyoung so who nobody really expected to be in the olympics now she's in the olympics so it's almost like giant kim just kind of got like glossed over unfortunately when she did retire so it's good that she's come back and now she's getting this this praise and she's getting the legends treatment finally I, yeah I, I there might be some some element to that where you look at like uh anik chauber sort of or like shauna coxy who both like they really retired at the olympics and they got the satisfaction of being at the olympics right um and then of course akio where you know you you win an olympic medal as you're as you're as you're going away as you're going away story yeah i think you're right i think it's it was a little bit hard to make time for all of the all of the stories in in 2019 2020 uh with so much going on i think that's fair enough um but uh yeah and i would i mean i would argue giant kim is more deserving than all of them in terms of like legend pray i mean yeah i'd put i'd put her and akio i'd put her and akio side by side but the rest like i I, I, yeah anakin anakin any we don't have to get into the details this but yeah akio and 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 giant kim i would put pretty much in the same in the same level as being like extraordinary figures in their in their disciplines um Man, what was the what was the last thing I was gonna say? One thing I wanted to say is I don't feel like she's really getting a legend treatment though, and this isn't that she's being denied something that people in the past have got. I just think we do a pretty bad job of like actually celebrating and explaining and teaching people about the impact of like the historical figures in climbing. So the fact that we have Jane Kim like back on the circuit, I really appreciate that she's getting some time, you know, on a microphone where where you know she's able to chat a little bit. But it would be nice to to actually do a little bit of content to give people some context so that when matt or whoever the commentators are call her a legend along with like you know whoever the what was the fuck there's a you know like a particular hotel worker that we've seen at a particular world cup for a bunch of years in a row like what an absolute legend for like you know remembering all of our names every time we come back to town like i can't can't be using the word legend for all these different people right and i've we've talked about this a million times but the legend treatment has to be more than just calling somebody an absolute legend there has to be a little bit more than that and explain to people because like look at look at all the feedback we get from who climbing fans are Every single year, I'd be willing to bet, like, and I, I, I'd be, I think we would actually be close to this. I'd be willing to say pretty close to half of the people watching any given World Cup have only been watching for a year or less, right? And part of that is a lot of new people coming into the sport, but also a lot of old people in the sport kind of just stop watching after time because the sport isn't always great at keeping you engaged in the long run. Sadly, it takes up a lot of time to watch it. It's you know. I, I think that's just uh, something we have to deal with. So if so many of our fans and the people that are watching have been watching for a year or less, they're not going to know anything about who Jane Kim is. In speed climbing, they're going to think like Indonesians and Chinese climbers have been the greatest speed climbers for all of history, even though, you know, that's just ignoring an entire continent that we just don't talk about right now because of like global stuff. So I think there does have to be a bit more, uh, or there should be, there should be a bit more actual service being paid to the, to the historic figures, especially when they show up at the event. I feel like that's the ultimate opportunity to do a little bit of that content and, and just do a short retrospective, like tell us about your first world cup back in 2005 or whatever, like what stuff has changed and like, who are the names that you remember from back then? And, and you know, how do you think that compares to the climbing today? Like, I, I think there's a lot of room for that stuff and it can be, you know, a five question video, but just little things to to explain why we're calling Jane Kim a legend, like, you know, whether it's just giving the medal count or how long she's been around or like listing all the people that she's beaten in history. Like, I don't know. I think there's room for that. Yeah. And influence counts for a lot, too. And I can tell you that 
Giant Kim, she is the reason that climbing, one of the key reasons why climbing is booming in Korea right now. And she's the reason, I would argue, why you have people like Chan So and Jong Won Chan uh, on the circuit right now. Because I don't want to act like Giant Kim was the first ever Korean competitor or anything like that, but she, she was just doing things that made people in that country take notice right and and so i think you you could make a case for giant kim being absolutely one of the most important figure in the history of like the korean climbing industry certainly in the gym industry over there uh and and so yeah i mean there's a lot of ways you could spin it but i'm i'm with you like yeah give some context uh, retrospective or just more details for these people uh, for the fans and, and for the new fans too, rather than just saying the legends, giant Kim, who's won this many gold medals. Well, there's, there's a lot more to the story there mm -hmm. and, uh, it'd be really interesting. Yeah. Like I can, like, if I do an interview with Jane Kim, it's going to get like 300 views. Like I don't have the, I don't have the, the output. Like if you guys have her in front of you at the world cup and you've got a microphone, a camera, like then's, that's the time to do it. Um, yeah. Should we move on from your headline for yeah. 40 minutes later? Yeah, or I feel like I've done my yeah. headline, my winner. You're, you're, we're uh, we're kind of yeah. mixed the format here, but what's your headline? My, headli my headline is more old people. This entire comp is just about old people, right? What's the, I... Yeah, my my thing is the men's podium was was just really fun to it was it was a nice podium to have, um, particularly given like the Jakob storyline, who after last season, which was like pretty rough season for him. Um, these last two events have been really refreshing and lovely. And, and I, I think one thing, so I'll just say, uh, so um, uh, Jakob Schubert comes in first place, Adam Andra in second, Alex Magos in third. The men's climb was, honestly, it looked like pretty chill through most of the climb. And then you basically got this hold by hold separation for eight moves straight, which is what kind of broke everybody at the top. And Jakob managed to get one move higher than Andra, who got one move higher than Magos or something like that. Um, but yeah, talking about Jakob, like last season, 2022, was the first time since his first medal in like 2008 or whatever, like 15 years ago. Last year was the first year where he didn't win a World Cup or a World Championship medal, right? Not just a gold, I mean medals in general. So he just earned no hardware last year, although he did come first place in the like European Championship combined in lead. Um, so last year it looked like it was really like a denouement for his career after taking the year off from, from the Olympics sort of, and then he comes back to the comps and doesn't do all of them and is like not having the greatest performances. You're kind of like, yeah, maybe this is the tail end of it and maybe he's wrapping it up even though he says he wants to do the olympics like is he finding the passion for it but hopefully it turns out that that was just an off year a bit of a break because while the boulder season didn't start super good this year um like didn't like made what he made like one semifinals i think in all the bouldering events uh we got medals now and he's looking excellent and just love seeing that he's that he's still relevant like another one of the actual people that deserves the name uh or deserves the title legend again like it was uh pretty cool that we got to see a couple of them in this finals um how do you feel about uh alex magos being labeled as like one of the old boys because even though he's got it by age, I'm, I kind of like, I feel like such a, like an asshole for, for doing this, but like he kind of left, right? He kind of like, he kind of bailed on the scene for, he basically did competition as a teenager, sort of. No extraordinary results, like made one or two semifinals. And then he just bailed completely until the Olympics was announced and then he just came right back. So like part of me is like, I'm not going to give this guy like any any time of day in terms of like celebrating his like history as a competitive climber. Because in my opinion, he, he kind of like bailed on it. Um, but he is almost 30 years old. And so it was in terms of age, at least it was quite an old boys club at the top of that uh, at the top of that finals list. Yeah, he's an interesting case. I've, I've never spoken to him. I've never interviewed him, but I've always gotten the impression that he just like either he doesn't love competing or he just loves outdoor climbing that much more than competing to, to your point, because he does seem very uh, kind of come and go uh, in terms of his presence on the on the World Cup circuit. It seems like he he comes to the circuit when there is a larger objective than just winning a World Cup, right? In case in point, the Olympics, right? Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm certainly not going to sit here and label Alex Migos uh, a, a 
a, a circuit legend or anything like that, but he is a big name, and I think he does bring some eyes to the sport. Oh, that's true, uh, yeah. I'd, which, I'd be curious to ask him is, you know, did did comp climbing just kind of ruin the sport for him when he was younger? Because maybe it was one of those things where it's just like, man, I don't want to do this competition thing anymore. Goes outside, blossoms in an environment where he's actually enjoying it. And he ends up becoming, you know, this this almost a household name in terms of outdoor climbing. I can't be the judge of that because I don't pay attention to outdoor stuff. But maybe even though it might have been the Olympics as the impetus to come back, I do find like he, it looks like he enjoys being at the competitions. It looks like he enjoys being in that limelight and climbing with those guys. So there is part of me that like, even though I'm a little bit snotty towards him for leaving in the first place, part of me also thinks like maybe he's one of those people where he did had to, he did have to leave in order to come back and actually have fun and actually do well. Um, and maybe now that he's back, he's actually found some love for it because he does seem to be smiling and enjoying his time with the other climbers. So uh, maybe I need to let go of of all this baggage. I don't know. It's probably me. It's probably not Alex Magos's fault. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to discount the possibility that maybe he had a change of heart. People change, you know, people, uh, grow and evolve in terms of their choices and their preferences. So it's very possible that he, he does enjoy it now. And maybe he needed that time off to, to have this enjoyment of it. I, I don't know, but he is definitely, uh, I, I, he's someone who I, I think you could safely say has had kind of a complicated relationship with comp climbing in, mm -hmm. in when you look at his his whole career it, he's kind of someone i'd say yeah he's he's um he's probably going to go down in history as a legend for out you know in the outdoor scene he's certainly a lumen a, like a luminary um figure there comp climbing not so much not yet mm -hmm. but He's, yeah, we'll see. He got a podium here, so he's still, yeah, certainly uh, a star. Yeah, certainly a star. Yeah, so yeah. that was really just my headline. Was it was a it was a nice little bit of storyline as we head into as we head closer and closer to the World Championships, which Jakob Schubert always seems to do well at World Championships. Like he never seems to miss a podium at the in, in a lead World Championship, kind of. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a, a nice counterpoint almost to the to the women's podium. Um, just seeing uh, seeing the old boys around, it was kind of cool. Can I mess with our format a little bit more yeah, here? Go and for it. <laughs> I'll talk about my loser. Because, Let's do it. Why not? And, and I can choose another loser when we get there. It's all but good. The, the, one of the losers that I was going to say was every single man under the age of 29. There you go. <laughs> because, of course, Magos is 29, Schubert is 32, I think, and Andres 30, give or take, something like yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm all for one of them, one of those uh, kind of throwback figures making it onto a podium or getting the gold medal. But let's be honest, the entire podium shouldn't be made up of people that were crushing back in 2015, 2016, right? Like 2009, you, like 2008, right? Would, like we're really going back. Yeah. You would expect and you would hope in terms of just the lineage and the development and the future of the sport that the young stars would be breaking through and the young stars would be beating the guys that are 30 31 32 you you and the fact that that's not happening or it didn't happen at this competition is a little disconcerting right it's like where are the young i don't know if the youngsters were like maybe in intimidated I don't know, but just to have all three spots on the podium taken up by by the old dogs, quote unquote, uh, what's going on here? It is. We are getting very, very close to like Jakob being able to say, oh, yeah, I won my first gold before you were born. Like that's not that far off. That's like a year off, depending on how the how the teams evolve. Um, if there is like an outstanding kid at a particular age right now, like that's going to happen, which is pretty, pretty extraordinary. And it shouldn't it shouldn't happen that way, right? Like, I'm a, like, well, weird. I think you'd agree. Like, it can it happens sometimes. That's just like how it goes. But it is like an ex, it and and now I, the the the, uh, the trivia question came up. Like, how often have we seen this podium? Just because uh, of of you know they're all they're all obviously successful climbers, particularly Adam and 
um, Adam and Jakob. And of course, Alex has had plenty of podium positions himself. But this podium in different orders has been together four different times, including, I think, this event, if I'm remembering that right from when we looked it up. So yeah, this these three guys have shared a podium four times just within World Cups and World Championships. Um, so that should become less and less likely over time as they all age out. But I mean, considering Adam Andra is maybe the greatest climber full stop regardless of discipline regardless of gender regardless of indoor outdoor he might be that guy right Jakob Schubert is one of the legendary figures in male competitive climbing and Alex Magos is one of at least in current day from what I understand one of the the extraordinary standouts in modern day climbing you got to say that's like that's a reasonable three set of characters if you if you take the age away you're like yeah that makes sense as a podium so it's just really cool that they are like still doing it still having fun so I don't know I loved it and that's why that's why it's my headline is because it should be unlikely like seeing like oh yeah you have a podium full of 30 year olds that should be unlikely and it is and so it's nice when it happens and uh and i'm glad we got to see it and it makes at least you know the two of us or at least me i'm holding on to 33 by like two or three days at this point it all ticks over soon and i'm like yeah it's still still my generation still my generation you know yeah it, it was cool i mean it was a, a total throwback podium and i uh, <laughs> I guess, the, like, for the sake of the sport, you hope that that's not, like, a consistent podium going forward. No. Because you, you want to see some youngsters breaking through, and I'm sure they will. Uh, so, and, and and it'd be exciting if, if all these guys could continue to hang with the, the competitors that are 21, 22, and whatnot. We'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, but, <laughs> yeah, is, it, is this debrief uh, 2023 or 2000? 17 or yeah, something for real let's talk about let's let's change the subject too much too much talk about old people let's talk about some uh some younger people i want to i just want to bring up my winner which is natalia kaluchka um because i i didn't really realize it until i looked at the tables i'm like oh this is her first ever speed world cup gold she of course won the world championships uh in uh, in moscow two years ago but it was like oh yeah it's first world cup that's really neat and the path i thought was was really interesting because i think in the last speed event that we had I mentioned how um, uh, uh, Desak Matarita Kusuma Dewi, or I'm just going to say DMRK, the Indonesian speed climber, until this event, she has only ever lost races against Alexandra Mirisla. That is the only person that she's lost a race to. Anybody else she faces, regardless of the round, she always beats them. And so coming into this event, I was like, oh, is this going to hold up? Is DMRK going to beat everybody, considering that Alexandra's not at this event? Like, let's see what happens. And as it turns out, the actual storyline of this event was Li Juan Deng having a heater of a competition, setting not just fastest time at the event, but also her own personal best, and then also the Asian speed record, like on an absolute frickin' tear, man. And so Li Juan Deng is the person that takes out DMRK, and it just kind of says, like, oh, to beat DMRK, you either gotta be the best of the last like five years, or you have to be having the like most amazing day of your life your literal personal best is what's required to beat this uh this climber so i thought that was really cool and of course bringing it back to natalia really quick natalia and and Li Zhuang, race of the day absolutely was in the semifinals where it was it was the ultimate buzzle beater buzzer beater pardon me super clean races neck and neck the entire time and they they're separated by like a hundredth of a second or something it was awesome I am just, and I'm sure everybody watching this is the same way, just salivating at the thought of, let's get this version of Lee Juan Dang up against Alexandra Miroslav. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fireworks. World Championships is, is going to be hot, man. Oh, if not Chamonix, yeah. Yeah, and and if you're Miroslav, you're watching this Vilar speed final, you're probably thinking, oh, man, like... Lee Juan is, uh, she, I mean, obviously she's not quite ticked up to, to Ola's metrics there, but it's, no. it's getting darn close. Yeah. I, and, uh, uh, the, the question I had the entire time, particularly because on the men's speed side for the Indonesians, we saw not as much success as we normally would have. I was kind of curious, like, how much has this break since, uh, what was the last speed event we had? It was it Salt Lake or Jakarta? I can't remember the order anymore. But we've had, like, over a month off, if I remember right, since the last Speed World Cup. And I was kind of wondering if that was long enough where people's form had really changed. Like, obviously, you're in a different state of fitness, given probably not traveling as much you're not having to perform so you're 
training can be more consistent or you treat it like a rest period. Um, but like we've said before, like this comp may have been more of a build up towards burn rather than a moment to perform in itself. So I really don't know how to read it. Like that's the, the one kind of caveat with all of this is like, how do you read Kiramel's not getting to finals? How do you read the, the Indonesian men just having a, a lackluster competition in general? How do you read Lee Juan Deng's incredible performance? Like, is there a lot of asterisks given that this event isn't the pinnacle on the calendar i honestly don't know but uh i thought it made for an extraordinary story like it was uh and it, it makes it really interesting because i think if i'm still remembering right only the top two speed climbers from burn go directly to the olympics the rest of the spots are are through the uh, through the rankings and through the continental stuff it's three in the combined but it's only two spots um for the speed i think and so there's you know that's that's like three four names that are starting to be like wow they're if not actual favorites, they're very close to being favorites. So I'm really psyched for that event. It's going to be great. Were you surprised that Alexandra Miroslav wasn't here? No, just because she let me down this hard last season. So now I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, you got priorities. I get it. It's just kind of a, a bummer. I want to see you win everything. I want to just see you go back to back to back to back to back. But, you know. Yeah, I, I kind of thought maybe she would be here and then skip Chamonix. That was kind of what I was thinking. Uh, I'll be honest; I haven't looked at the the registrations for Chamonix, so I don't actually know if she's if she's going to be there or not. I kind of assume she isn't. I, you know, Poland is close enough to 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 Switzerland and and France that if she wants to go, she can, and it's not that much of like a travel situation. Um, so my guess is it's just going to be like she's got her own thing, and she'll just show up to burn and uh, and try to be prepared for that. Yeah, I mean that's a risky strategy to go that long without. But but I mean, who are we to say? Yeah, right? who are you? You want to? Yeah, you want to? You want to tell Alexandra to do? Yeah, yeah, I mean, she she manages to come into each season looking fire. So yeah. what can I say? So yeah, so my winner was, of course, talked about everybody but Natalia Kaluchka. But basically, just saying Natalia Kaluchka survived the threat of DMRK. She survived the, I, in my opinion, the best speed climber from from this event, which was Lee John Deng, um, and uh, and walks away with her first gold. And uh, so yeah, the two sisters can both say they've got World Cup golds, but Natalia is the only one with the World Championship gold, if I remember right. So yeah, cool little dynamic happening in the shadow underneath Alexander Miroslav, of course. Yeah, and while we're on the subject of speed, uh, let me give a shout out to Emma Hunt as well, who yeah. could could have easily I could easily choose her as my winner for this competition as well because she sets another American record. She didn't win the gold medal, but I said in my recap, I think this was her finest performance nonetheless. I thought she just looked psyched and just laser focused but also just like relaxed the whole for every race. I just it was a, a great weekend for Emma and it's it's getting hard to keep track of all her American records. I was looking at this. This is just kind of interesting for the American like speed record aficionados or whatever. But so she sets a new one here at six, six, eight. So I looked back. I was just like, oh, I want to like trace back some of her records. So six, six, eight here at Vilar. Before that, the record was uh, six, seven, nine. Before Emma, that, Emma uh, Hunt as well, right? Yeah. Oh, these are all Emma. Okay. This is all Emma. <laughs> six, seven, nine. Then it was before that six, eight, two. Before that six, eight, four. Before that seven, oh, five, seven, one, seven, seven, one, nine. Jesus. And then I had to, I was like, my, anything else is in another notepad, but I think it keeps going. Like, right. I think there were more. Yeah. Uh, she's just the vanguard at this point, right? She really is. And, and she's, she just continues to i mean look at that like going from 679 to 668 like that's not that's a that's a substantial margin when you're talking about going that fast so the fact that she's still breaking her record by by that much uh great great stuff from from Emma continental mm -hmm. record too i believe I think so. Her. I think three continental records were broken at this one. So it would have been yeah. the Asian women, the continent, or the American women, and there was one more, but I don't remember who it would have been. But anyway, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, did you have any other like uh, winners you wanted to talk about, or should we get to, to losers and wrap it up? Given, given we're, we're already at like an hour, we probably don't have to drag this one out too much. Well, I don't know if we acknowledged in all of our talk about Yanya. I don't think we acknowledged just the phenomenal performance of mm -hmm. topping every route 
throughout the whole weekend. It wasn't mm. just that she came out and gave that women's final round the perfect conclusion by being the last one out and being the only one to top it and also doing the 360 spin move as the cherry on top, but she topped everything. Mm -hmm. It's it's just uh, it, it's just whenever you think Yanya cannot top what she just did, meaning like the the previous World Cup, like you're like okay, what what she what can she do here at Villar that can possibly top what she did in, in uh, where was it Innsbruck, right? Um, and yet she somehow she she manages to just to just do something even more amazing. So. Yeah, tip of the hat to her. Yeah, it was a killer as well. Like, I mean, it would be nice because the 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 only conflicting storyline I still see is we're still trying to get our bearings on who I Mori is. So I would like to see her a bit more. Not that I'm convinced that I Mori would beat Yanya, but I would like to see more of her because I think the storyline is still driven mostly by the incredible lead results from last year. So it would be nice to get a little bit more info. What is she like across a consistent season? We're not going to see that, but, and of course, as we always say, like, this is the season, of course, to strategize. And if it's got to be for the world championships, then you got to do what you got to do. But that's that's kind of in terms of storylines. I know Yanya can be the best, but that one person who's acting as the challenger, you know, and the present day, at least, is currently Imori. And uh, it's too bad we didn't get to see her this uh, this weekend. Yeah, I mean, the big what if is uh, how would Imori have done on that big dino on sure, those yeah. green holds in the final round, presuming she made it to the final round? Yeah. I don't know. I, I that is not a gimme move for Imori. And we saw someone like Jian Kim, right? I don't think Jian fell on that move, but she fell shortly thereafter. This goes back to what I was saying in my headline how there were really no gimme sections of this route. That dynamic part would have posed a, I I think it would have posed a, a challenge for for Imori. She would have probably tried and tried and tried to figure out a way to do it statically and knowing how good i mori is she very well might have found a way to do that move statically well if natsuki tani can do it who i kind of put put in that same territory of like yep. if you're scared of dynamic moves there's there's another good like canary in the coal mine it's like can natsuki do it um but she managed to so it was all yep. good that was probably the most surprising moment in the discord chat this time around was was seeing natsuki stick that that move actually yep. but anyway um yeah let's talk about losers i don't want to i don't want to spend too much time on it um we already kind of talked about commentators i did want to shout out malik tell of the canadian uh head coach for actually being a great semi-finals commentator um particularly because the semi-finals ended with all this technical chatter around like what happens with this particular rope incident that's causing possibly technical appeals um, of course nothing happened uh with that issue and so it wasn't a huge deal but it was really nice having somebody like malik who who is uh is extremely experienced and knows the rules uh inside and out i thought he was a great person to have for that um i hope he gets to do more of those although you know i'm sure he prefers that he would be coaching in those rounds rather than getting to commentate for them but it was really nice hearing him i'm glad he got to do that Actual losers, though, um, the freaking drone shot in speed climbing where the drone was like ascending yeah. along with it. That was and hopefully they got it out of their system and it's not going to come back. Like, like I said, it's, I'm sure that's excellent. Like B-roll footage um, might be nice for the for the final, you know, highlight reel at the end or promotional stuff. But man, it was you can't tell who's winning. Like if it's a close race, you have no sense of who is slightly ahead. You have no sense of like who's moving ahead or falling back, which you can you can see that from just the straight on shot yeah the drone shot was really useless it was like you you couldn't even tell who won if you didn't have the angle on the on the clocks that was probably like the most egregious thing from the entire weekend miho's, yeah, tell... miho's like bolt step maybe but i don't know well you could tell that the drone shot was kind of throwing matt groom for a loop too because how do you commentate be... if you don't know who's winning like yeah, it fucked him out was... as well yeah, you kind of really felt for him because yeah. he would he would they they'd be there lined up for the start mm -hmm. and then it would switch to the drone and Matt's all of a sudden just kind of like oh uh, it, it's a yeah race. there's and there's nothing you can do about it like what can right. you call you just be like yeah they're still climbing they're still on the wall nobody's falling yet that's all you that's all you see, can do you can't see the clock yeah. you can't see like you said who's who's leading because those margins are usually pretty pretty mm -hmm. slim you can't see anything about 
placement in terms of the the limbs right on the handholds or the footholds uh in terms of anything that's useful for viewing like you can't see if there's a slip or anything yeah i mean it's a cool shot don't get me wrong like it's 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 really neat but it's not good for in the moment tracking the race Mm -hmm. um that was too bad i i do i I, you mentioned the bolt thing with me oh yeah i i I don't know if you want to say Miho is the loser. That doesn't make, feel right because you just feel so bad for her. I don't know if you want to say the fans are the losers, but I, I've always on. I've always taken the loser title like like you know pretty tongue in cheek. So I'm not too I'm not too concerned who we call out for it. Like whatever. Yeah, it's 2023. We have bolt covers. They exist. Why not just cover every bolt? I I don't I don't know. I don't get it. But I, the one thing I'll say is it was in qualification, which is the round where you have the most climbs on the wall. So you're covering the most surface area and maybe you just run into a spot where you're like, well, we don't have enough. So you have to prioritize, which is like an oversight in itself. But in that case, if that is the situation, it's not really the root setters fault. Like if you give, you know, the root setters, I don't think do the purchasing of this stuff. They're just, they get what they're given in terms of holds. So if you give a root setter 10 bolt covers and they decide, man, I really wish we had 12, but they can't get two more. Then at that point, it's not really the root setters fault. It's really more just like the, the, the organizers not providing enough. Um, yeah, it's not, not the end of the world to me. Like it's kind of a a rite of passage that I hope most climbers get to experience one day is stepping on a bolt cover or stepping on a poster, like as cruel as it is, you know, you gotta, everybody's gotta know what that feels like to some extent. Um, yeah. Well, you, you feel bad for Miho though, because first of all, she did pretty well at Innsbruck. If I remember in lead, wasn't she like mm -hmm. 13? Yeah, she's, she is doing well. Yeah. So like that's a that's pretty high. So that this did really wreck her. I think she finished in thirty seventh. Mm-hmm. I don't uh, know how she would have finished without it. Like I I think she mentioned somewhere like how high she got, or maybe there was video, but I I haven't calculated like if she would have made semis or not. I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, still but it, still sucks. It's too bad though because we know the depth of the Japanese team, and so we know that these results, like, like it very well might come down to whether somebody made Mm -hmm. semis or or didn't make semis in terms of when they're selecting and and seeding things for the, like who gets the shot at the Olympics and the Olympic qualifying series and all that. I mean, it goes back to what we said with potentially with giant Kim. It's like these results, these matter. Even if you're not getting into the finals or getting onto a podium, there could be implications. Uh, We will see, but Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just, yeah, I felt bad for Miho. Uh, because this just doesn't help matters, obviously, for her for her seating or anything like that. So it's yeah. too bad. Yeah, not at all. Did you have a particular loser or anything aside from that? That was really it. I I, I really kind of struggled to find somebody. I, I goes back to mm. my headline. I thought it was a really good competition overall. I really kind of mm. struggled to somebody that I would put in the loser category. So thumbs up. Me. Well, I guess my last shout out will be like a uh, tying in with the Miho thing like Miho Nanaka famously not really but famously the first Japanese climber to win a Japanese speed medal um, this weekend we get to see Japan walk away with their second speed medal Ryo Omasa gets the first Japanese male speed medal and the second Japanese overall which is extraordinary to think for how long speed climbing has existed and we talked a couple you know whatever the last speed events were about like Japan actually becoming a bit more of a relevant player in speed so I think that's very cool now you can look at his pathway there which I think was like he managed to beat like Rishat on a foot slip um, Reza on a foot slip he himself false starts in semifinals so you know like if he had can you imagine winning a gold medal off just like beating four people on foot slips? Like how, how bonkers would that be for your country's first medal? But if I remember right, that's approximately what happened to Miho too. And so when you get those like really out there, out there speed medals, it usually has a lot to do with like what happened in the other lane, if we're honest. Okay, this brought up two things that I want to okay. say. I'm glad you mentioned this. So first of all, about speed, something else I forgot to say about Emma Hunt was uh, it was tweeted out, I think her dad tweeted out that she actually... Uh, her luggage was lost it was oh, in route to and it was not i think i don't think it's been found yet uh so and that's you know that's just added stress to all this i think she ended up uh, on the podium there she was wearing like her 2019 usa climbing team jacket or something like that because that's the one she had in her luckily she had her her kit in her carry-on right. bag and not in her in her uh checked bags but hopefully 
all of us here, hopefully Emma's bags get found soon and return to her. Uh, but the other thing, so this is something that Josh Herlebaus at speedclimbing.com, if you don't mm -hmm. follow him, follow him on Twitter, follow him on Instagram, go to his website. And YouTube, yeah. yeah, yeah. And YouTube, yep, for sure. He's a friend of the show. He's been on a couple times. So he tweeted something out. And this, I thought of this because you did mention the two false starts in the half final for the men. Uh, Sam Watson false started and then Rio false started. And Josh tweeted something out. I'm going to read what he said. Again, it's it's uh, on Twitter. It's speed-climbing.com or at speed underscore climb, I guess, is the Twitter handle. But he said, this is from Josh, reaction time thresholds in sports make sense if the set period is mandated to be motionless until the start, like in track and field, right? Think of sprints when they're in the sprint blocks. They have to stay still. Uh, but Josh says, in speed climbing, there should be no threshold as long as you don't leave the sensor before the green. I thought that was a really interesting point that he makes there. And just to give some context for what he's saying here, uh, there's a certain amount of reaction time that competitors are allowed to have. They can't leave the buzzer at like zero, zero, right? Like, um, because it's not humanly possible to react that fast. And so Josh is saying, since you're, you're allowed to move in, in speed climbing at the start, you just have to keep your foot stationary on the, on the pad. So therefore, his assertion is competitors should be allowed to to have virtually no threshold for for that um, that start it, time. Your foot doesn't even have to be stationary, right? It just has to be applying has pressure. To be on the so your foot can be pivoting. I, I doubt people slide their feet, but they certainly pivot their feet as they change their body position while they swing. That's really interesting, actually, because the angle there's there's two angles that make this this uh, hundred millisecond. Um, false start threshold uh pointless like in in my opinion and this is this is a new one for me the one i've always talked about which is um requiring a reaction time makes a lot of sense if you don't know when the gun is going to fire right like the if we take it from running where there's a literal like start gun right if you don't know when that gun is going to fire everybody's very first impression of the gun going off is the gun itself going off there's nothing that precedes it there's no motion that they can see there's no sound they can hear that gives a clue as to when the gun is going to go off so if that is your first actual stimulus yes your brain must process that sound and then propel your body but that's not the case in speed climbing there are three beeps and as far as i know the first two beeps are always a consistent duration apart from the last beep. And so just like any drummer or musician or you, if you just clap your hands three times in a row, like you just have, uh, it, it's, it's just rhythm. Like after those first two beeps, because the spacing is the same between all three beeps, you can predict accurately. And if you're a good athlete, you can predict it even more accurately. You can predict when that beep is going to come. So in speed climbing, after I've heard those first two beeps, I can already know when that last beep is coming and i don't need the 100 milliseconds because i can make my body fire right like right when the buzzer right when the beep goes right when the final beep goes so that always made the 100 millisecond thing make no sense to me and i always wondered like oh is there actually maybe some variation in the beeps but i am very confident in my crappy like trombone player like musicians skills to say like no there isn't like it is consistent between three beeps so that's one reason why the 100 millisecond thing makes no sense but then josh's is an excellent point as well by itself that yes these climbers are actually moving and you just watch they are not stationary they are kind of like getting into a bit of a swing throughout the entire starting sequence i think that's an excellent point that he added that i'd never considered uh, yeah i think it's great so Two, two takeaways, everybody listening, check out Josh Josh's stuff, speedclimbing.com, Josh Herlebaus, because he's got all sorts of media, social media stuff, YouTube, as mm -hmm. you said. Great, um, like great shorts on YouTube, like like 50 yeah. seconds or less and, and just analyzing speed climbs. It's awesome. Yes, and all great insights like this that you really don't get anywhere else. And But secondly, I really hope that, I don't know how, you know, how this idea, these ideas can be ushered to the rule makers when they update the IFSC updates the rule book for next season. But I really hope they somehow can, this can get on their radar and they can take these things that we're saying here, Josh's point and your point 
into consideration and maybe amend the the idea of having um, no threshold because the, these are really logical points. Can I you know, let me bring up one last point, which is actually negates the last two things I said, which is what if what if maybe that's the reason that's been stated in the past to have this hundred millisecond thing. What if it's that the timers, like the foot pressure pads and stuff, aren't accurate enough to consistently like. Actually, I don't know if that makes a difference. I, I was just going to say, like, what if the equipment is just so crap that they need that window in order to properly register, like, that kind of reading? And I shouldn't say crap. Maybe it's like, I like, I know in swimming, I know that that's a, an issue they have with timers in swimming because of, like, water or pool fluctuations or something. There is a certain amount of, of, uh, of rounding, I think, that happens in swimming race timing uh but anyway that's just kind of came to mind is like oh what if it's actually just the technology can't handle instantaneous starts i don't know yeah i don't know but it's certainly worth considering all mm -hmm. of this stuff is is worth taking under consideration and if the technology isn't there uh i don't know i feel like that would be a, a you know something that if it's not there yet it, it could be there you would think relatively quickly or you know within the next couple years or something but i i would imagine the techno i don't know i don't know i don't want to speak because i have no idea clocks are our downfall as a sport clocks for, for a sport that spent so much of its formative years in switzerland we just cannot handle a clock for some reason <laughs> what a disaster <laughs> at least we have auto belays that's it. at, at least, least we uh, at least we got auto belays. working on the speed climbing rope thank uh, god yeah. yeah well let's end it on that positive note at least we have auto belays everybody we're not all horologists but at least we have auto belays um thanks very much to watching for watching to the end of this video of course we do this after every world cup and we will be back next week after chamonix and Briançon and the world championships and everything that comes after so thanks for watching make sure you like it subscribe to this channel if you've ever watched more than two of these videos of course follow john follow uh follow myself whatever you want to do i'm just rambling at this point join the plastic weekly discord if you like talking about comps support it on patreon if you like and otherwise we'll just see you guys in the next one that you choose to watch hopefully next week i'm gonna get my mouse over here because again it's busted trying to get to the stop record button and i'm ready and just like that thanks again we'll see you in the next one